guys. This is Lydia, the lifestyle coach, and so excited to have an amazing woman and a thought leader in such an important area of the world back on this show. This is our third appearance because it's like there's so much to talk about, and I've gotten so much great feedback from you guys about how helpful her words have been, um, and I just love what she does. So, so happy that she's here. And for those of you who are new, hello. I'm Lydia, the lifestyle coach, and I help women to be free from food crazies using nothing but their own brain. And we have so many great resources here and new videos every Monday, including the other two interviews with this amazing woman that you can check out as well. But you guys, we have back on the show, Isabel Foxen Duke. Yay! And it's so, so fun. So just introducing her. She's the creator of Stop Fighting Food, the free video training program for women who want to stop feeling crazy around food. And after years of trying to overcome emotional eating, binge eating, and chronic weight cycling through traditional and alternative approaches, Isabel discovered some radical new ways to get women over their food issues once and for all, not just by shifting the mindsets of individuals, but by challenging the dominant diet culture as a whole, which I love, and we're going to talk about that today. So a fixture and a thought leader in the greater body positive movement. Isabel has been featured in the Huffington Post, Elle Magazine, um, Exo Jane, and has been praised by Ricky Lake. So, so excited to have her on the show today. Isabel Fox and Duke, Hello. welcome back. Hello. Thank you so much for having me, Lydia. It's super fun to be here as always. I love chatting with you. So thanks so much for having me. Yes. I'm really excited for our chat today. And, you know, we've been over, you know, some things about, you know, deprivation and, you know, the importance of, you know, body image, body positivity. And so something that comes up so much um, that I'm excited that we get to focus on today is really looking at the diet culture, the diet mentality, and why there's just this sort of programming in us as women, as people, you know, as a whole of just like this need of thinness, right? Of just like, oh, like, what is that, right? <laughs> and it's so much to do with the messages of the world. So yeah, like introduce us a little bit about, help us understand, first of all, just the basics of like, what is diet culture? What is diet mentality? Well, I'll start by just saying, I think that one of the biggest issues is, I think that a lot of people are sort of on board with quote unquote, the non-diet approach, right? Like people are like, yeah, I get it. Dieting doesn't work. But then the question really becomes, well, what is dieting, right? Like, what does that actually mean, right? Is it Atkins? Is it Weight Watchers? Is it something else? Is there a difference between dieting versus just eating healthfully, right? Like, there starts to become a greater conversation about what is dieting. And I think, you know, what I found for myself and sort of what I teach, right, is that dieting is actually not really necessarily, or it's at least not only about the actual behaviors that you're taking or the actual intentions that you're making with food, uh, but the way you think about food, right, and the way you think about your body and the way that you operate holistically around these things, right? So I often say dieting is, a, is not an action so much as a state of mind, right? If I am trying to um, do things right so that I can make my body look right in some way, um, if I'm operating from a place of thin is good, fat is bad, you know, this behavior good, this behavior bad, you know, if I'm operating in this sort of black and white way that many women often think about food, right? There's a right way and a wrong way. I'm on the wagon. I'm off the wagon, right? There's all of these sorts of deeper ways that I think um, were affected by dieting. And that, in my opinion, that's what dieting really is, right? It's sort of these ways that we think about and these ways that we operate around food that are dictated to us, of course, by culture, right? So, yeah. you know, the culture that says that thin is good and fat is bad and that, you know, all women's value is based on how they effectively, how thin they can become. And, you know, your ability to garner praise and love and acceptance in this world is your ability to achieve this thing called thinness, whatever amount of thinness that you are trying to achieve. Um, that's going to start to impact the way you operate, the way you think around food, the way you behavior, the way you just literally, the way you operate in your food behaviors on like a deeper level than just, am I not on Weight Watchers anymore and attempting intuitive eating, right? So yeah. it sort of starts to, we started starting to have a deeper conversation, not just transitioning from 
theoretically Weight Watchers, for instance, to intuitive eating, but actually starting to think about you know, the sort of the bigger implications of how do I think about my body? How do I think about food? Is, am I looking at my body like, you know, the mammal that she is and the, and the person that needs love and care that she is? Or am I still thinking about her as like a thing to manipulate, to make look good for the outside world? This is really where recovery, in my opinion, happens. Um, is not just in the transition from let's say Weight Watchers or Atkins or, you know, paleo or vegan to intuitive eating, but actually really transitioning the way we think about food, the way we think about our bodies on a deeper level. Yeah. I love that. I think that is all so important. And even just thinking about the, the language that we're used to hearing. Like if you hear a woman say, I've been good today, or I've been bad today, like right. A huge value judgment and you know it's related with food. Oh, I have been good because I have set aside all of these foods, eliminated all of these evil, you know, foods. And it's like, it's amazing how much we attach our worth and our value to like the stuff that we ate or didn't eat, depending on the dictates. And I hear women talk this way even, and I think that this is why I'm so passionate about this conversation, is I hear women talk this way even when they're attempting things like intuitive eating, which are obviously wonderful things that you know help us get in touch with our bodies, but we can approach it with diet mentality. Like, oh, I ate when I was hungry and I stopped when I was full, so I was good today, right? And it's like that, you know, it's a, it's a well-meaning attempt to move in the direction of recovery. And obviously I'm a huge fan of listening to your body and, and sort of listening to your body for hunger cues and things like that. I think that's super, super important. But approaching it from this diet mentality of I'm good if I'm eating when I'm hungry and stopping when I'm full. I'm bad if I fall off the hunger and fullness wagon. Oh, I, I ate emotionally. I'm bad. Ugh. Or, you know, I screwed up intuitive eating, right? All of this is remnant diet thinking, right? And it can be um, equally as, as sort of painful and create a lot of the same kinds of behaviors, especially when it comes to binge eating. It can lead to a lot of binge eating behaviors also because, you know, binge eating, when I'm, my, in my experience, right, with clients and also just with myself personally, one of the most uh, greatest triggers of binge eating is the feeling of failure. The feeling that I failed, I've fallen off the wagon, might as well start tomorrow. Right? And this can happen. I think often does happen for people. I know for me, I'll just speak for myself personally, in the beginning of my attempting intuitive eating and listening to my body for cues around food rather than external diets, um, you know, I often felt like, oh, I failed at intuitive eating. I ate when I wasn't hungry. I ate emotionally. I fell off the intuitive eating wagon. And then that would spiral into a huge binge, right? Yeah, so and then it's like, oh, well, I might as well, right? It's like, I screwed up today. And it's all about that, like, right or wrong value. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it was like, my experience is like, it wasn't enough just to transition out of, you know, taking external diet directions about what I should be eating and how much I should be eating and all of that. It wasn't enough just to transition from that kind of a diet to, let's say, intuitive eating or mindful eating. I also had to change the way I fundamentally thought about how I approach things like intuitive eating, how I approach my bleeding, how do I approach my food, right? Am I approaching my food from a place of actually self-caring, my like little baby body that I love so much and oh, hey little girl, what do you need right now? You feeling okay? What's going on? You need a hug? You need a, you know, apple? What do you need, right? I wasn't approaching it from that way in the beginning. I was approaching it from the, if I get intuitive eating right, I will be thin and I need to get intuitive eating right. I need to not eat when I'm hungry, not, not hungry. I need to not eat emotionally. I need to not do what's wrong. I was totally pathologizing any kind of behavior around food um, that was for pleasure and not necessarily just because I was hungry, which is something I also want to talk to you about. Um, so yeah, so I think that, you know, I call it the hunger and fullness diet. When we apply diet mentality thinking to um, even our attempts at intuitive eating, which might be... Yeah you know, really wonderful things to attempt. But again, if we're not changing our brain, if we're not changing the attitude that we take um, with that, we're going to fall into a lot of the same traps as we were with traditional diets even. Yeah. And, you know, one way that, you know, I, I've talked about it before is like, you know, we, you can make anything into a diet, right? It's like, there's the physical deprivation and there's the mental deprivation. There's the physical of like, well, are you feeding yourself? Right. And yeah. there's the mental deprivation that you can take two people that are the same size, that have the same caloric needs, if that's even something we want to pretend exists, right? right and right. they can eat the exact same thing. And one person 
can be in complete diet mentality. There's all this guilt. There's all this right and wrong. And they're not eating anything differently. It's just that there's a mental deprivation of like, you know, what is, you know, the food that I'm eating saying about who I am, my right or wrong, my good or bad, all of that. Right. Exactly. Emotional, just basically shame and judgment. I mean, one of the reasons we call, I mean, I remember when I was like writing like emotional deprivation, when I was like first like using that term, the reason that that term sort of came to my mind and that was sort of the term that I wanted to call the shame and judgment that we often feel around our eating behaviors is because if you think about it, right, feeling shame and judgment around food implies that the the thing that I'm doing is something that I should not be doing and therefore should try not to do in the future. So actually, when you're experiencing shame and judgment around food, you're actually setting yourself up for that last supper mentality, right? Like you're setting yourself up for that feeling of, um, I guess I should just eat it now and tomorrow I'll try not to do that. Even if that's not a conscious thought, if you're telling yourself, oh, this is so bad, I shouldn't be doing this, you're, the implication is that I'm in last supper mentality. Does that, does that make yeah. sense? No, yeah. I love that. I think that is so incredibly useful. And just on a quick note of like that, you know, success and failure and that mentality you know, when we set ourselves up for this idea, like when we set ourselves up for an idea that inherently like must fail, for instance, if I do intuitive eating perfectly, I'm going to be super, super thin. Mm -hmm. I remember how long I really tried to do everything perfect and my body wasn't turning into like, you know, six pack abs with just like my skin stretched on top of it. It is like realizing that with all of the great things, like even with just totally natural eating, following our hunger cues, like no food issues, it doesn't mean that success is our bodies turning into something that they're just never going to naturally be. Like no. we all have different genetics, but I think that's another layer of that failure of like, oh, okay, like I'll be super thin if I do this. So just wanted to put that out there of like, that may not be the result, right? Yeah, I think that that's super, super important. So, I mean, let's just sort of getting into the meat of your question of what is diet culture. So if you assume that diet culture is all the messages that we get around, that we get from around us, that basically teach us how to think about food in this success failure model, this black white model, this on and off the wagon model, you know, all of these different ways that we operate around food almost without thinking about it, like without even realizing there's another option of a way to think about food. We just think about food as a thing to achieve, a thing to do correctly. All of those mental ways that we often find ourselves operating around food, we'll call that diet mentality. Diet culture, right, is like where we're getting these messages. Diet culture basically just comes from it's any number of beliefs, attitudes, or behaviors around food that stem from the belief that thin is good and fat is bad, right? Like that's my most simple, that's the most simple definition that I can come up with for diet culture, right? Is diet culture is the system of beliefs and attitudes around us that are influencing our food choices and the way we operate with food and operate around our body that basically send us the message that thin is good and fat is bad. It is incredibly challenging. It is incredibly difficult to challenge this belief system, right? Like challenging the message that thin is good and fat is bad is a lifelong practice that in and of itself is not something you'll ever achieve perfectly. Probably not. Just like we don't overcome any number of, um, you know, cultural stigmas perfectly, right? Like I'm never going to perfectly overcome even my own internalized sexism, for instance. Like I'm always working on dealing with those stigmas and biases in my mind. And I'm always going to be working on challenging the idea that thin is good and fat is bad. That's an ongoing practice for me, which I think kind of, you know, another way that diet culture really affects us is I think that people believe that there's some day when they'll just be fixed and done and it's just over and, you know, body image will just be like no problem whatsoever and they'll just, everything will just be easy and they're just trying to achieve a thing. And I think really, you know, that's often can set us up for failure as well, right? Like really it's like we're trying to change our relationship with a definitively screwed up way of operating around bodies that is just happening around us all the time. Like I'm trying to change my relationship with this screwed up culture and try to think differently on a moment to moment basis, one day at a time for the rest of my life. Like uh, there is no like, there's no like day when all of a sudden there's going to be like the magic wand and I'm going to be fixed of, uh, of, you know, the, of, fat phobia, for instance, you know? Yeah. I think that's, that's a great perspective there. And I think that's a great shift of, of, 
approach to it. Because one thing that I think is so interesting is like in our culture, there's sort of this idea of like, okay, yeah, like I have ingrained sexism and they've come from outward messages that society's put on me. And so I can examine those and move through them. And what I think is so interesting about diet culture is there's very much this, oh, that doesn't have to do with anything else. I just internally, inherently really, really want to be thin. It's totally a personal thing. Like, why do you think it is that we accept other sorts of like prejudice as, oh, they've been pushed upon me. And then this sort of like thin is good, fat is bad is is more of a like internal, like, oh, that's, that's just how I feel. Or have you found that in your experience? Well, I think that, well, I think first of all, I think that there are a lot of ways that internalized sexism, for instance, affect us that we don't even necessarily think of, like we don't even notice, right? Like I think yeah. that there are lots of ways that internalized sex, I'll speak for myself personally. Like I think that there are lots of ways that intern, I'm only, I'm just sort of uncovering all of the different ways that internalized sexism affects me. Um, that I never even was aware of, that I just was like, oh, this is the way it is, right? This is just, it was just a feeling that I have. We don't realize that our feelings and our thoughts about things and our desires are even often really culturally dictated. Um, I often think like, you know, when people say, I want to be thin, I often ask them to imagine if they grew up on a, if they just were like lived alone on a desert island, if they were raised alone in like the blue lagoon on a desert island with no other humans, would they even know what thin or fat was? right like there would be if there was no frame of reference if there was no culture around you you know to sort of basically have this frame of reference of like what then and of like what's if you couldn't compare yourself to other people basically you would have no there would be no concept of thinner of thinner fat right so by definition it's a social cultural thing right there's no such thing there's no such thing as inherent desire i don't really think like when it comes to these kinds of issues. It's like, we're always, um, we're always, I mean, we're obviously being affected. If I asked you, and I think that this comes, this is, comes up for people all the time. Like, why do you want to be thin? If you really press somebody on why they want to be thin, they will often hesitate in coming up to the, like, basically something to the effect of like, I think it makes me look better. I think people will like me more, you know, like those kinds of, um, answers. It's hard to get people to actually say those things out loud because I think that it's so, it feels really confronting to actually admit those things. But for the most part, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who is trying to lose weight for other reasons with the exception of quote health, which I'm going to just shelve for a second as a separate conversation. Yeah. For the most part, outside of this context of health, again, separate conversation that we're going to shelve for the moment, for the most part, people want to be thin because they want to look different to the outside world. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to separate ourselves from that. Like, I think it's hard, I think it's hard to deny. Um, yeah. I'm very, very, <laughs> yeah, at some point I'm very, I'm very aware of it and, um, in myself and others. Absolutely. Or have been. And that was a huge part of my recovery process was realizing that so much of my body image issues are tangled up with how I'm perceived by others. Right. I mean, like when I was struggling the most with my body image, you know, there were days when I just didn't want to leave the house because I was embarrassed, right? Because at the end of the day, this was very much about how other people perceived me. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's hard to deny it. I just think that it's a lot of people just don't, it's almost like we don't think about it because we, it's so obvious. It's almost yeah. so obvious that we just don't even consciously really put words to it because it's that, straightforward. Like that's the way it is, right? Right. It's I just think so it's, normalized. Yeah. I just think it's so interesting how our culture is like, so we're impacted by all sorts of things on a, you know, a, a level that we're not conscious of, right? Like we all have ingrained, you know, sexism and prejudice and like, you know, all these sorts of things. So we, it's impacting us in ways we don't even realize. But I think that there's sort of this um, acceptance and like, encouragement in society to like look at that like well look at where your racism or your sexism comes from and I feel like there's hardly any encouragement to be like oh well there's this concept is thin is good and fat is bad and you should really look at that like I feel like that's still given as a truth whereas in like racism isn't given as a like oh well yes that's the way it is like there's more sort of like movement toward examining our our biases there as opposed to examining this like thin versus versus fat prejudice? Well, most people don't think about fat phobia, right? Or discrimination on the basis of weight bias. Most people don't think of fat phobia as a social justice issue at all. 
And I think that that's the biggest issue, right? Like, I mean, there's so much racism, sexism still continually happening, but we have language to describe it to some extent, and people are aware of its existence as a thing. People aren't always aware of the ways in which it's impacting them without their knowledge or subconsciously. Like, I think that there's always layers of the onion to peel in any of these isms and any of these biases. Um, but one of the challenges, I think, with weight bias specifically is that most people don't even think about it as a social justice issue. The words fat phobia, that's a word that most people have never heard of. I mean, I'll just speak for my clients specifically. Most of my clients who come to me, they've never even heard of the term fat phobia. They've never heard the term weight bias. They've never even thought about it as an ism, right? That That's comparable to other social justice issues like discrimination on the basis of, uh, you know, gender or race, for instance. Um, as I'm getting more deep into this, you know, I realize there's, you know, so many different ways. I think that there's a lot of different isms that people just don't have a lot of familiarity with. Um, but fat phobia is definitely a huge one that's affecting a lot of people, right? Probably the majority of people in this country. And there's just literally no language around it. And it's completely, um, we don't, we don't, ex we don't, think about it as a social justice issue, we think about it more and more as a medical issue, um, which isn't really in alignment with science. We didn't always think of it as a medical issue. It's pretty recent history that we've thought about it as a medical issue. Prior to it being considered a medical issue, it was just considered a fat issue, right? Like it was just considered a, you know, this is what looks good. This is the way, this is what's pretty on women, you know? And before that, of course, we had the opposite situation where what was beautiful was to be bigger, right? And so I think that this is, there's an evolution of the way that we've thought about weight and what it means to us culturally. We're kind of moving from, well, you know, 150 years ago, let's say, bigger was better, smaller was, you know, less pretty. Then we kind of flipped the switch when, uh, uh, thin became harder to attain when there became more food surplus and there was more food readily available in the economy. Now, you know, poor people are basically getting fatter. And so rich people want, like, you know, that becomes the status symbol is to be thin, like rich people. <laughs> um, uh, and then we have this sort of evolution into, okay, it's a fashion issue. Now it's a medicalized issue. And so, you know, it's sort of looking at how we understand we culturally has a history um, but one of the things that is, is, you know, most people don't see it as, is most people don't see it as a social justice issue. Most people, that's not, um, that's not a language that the majority of the country has. It's a small minority of people who are really starting to have that conversation of weight bias as like a legitimate way that people are being discriminated against. Um, so yeah. Yeah, which I think, I'm, I love what you do, and like I love that you are a voice for that, because I think that's a really important voice for all of us to kind of be spreading of like, okay, yeah, like this actually, this is a social justice issue, because if you, if you have a conversation with anyone, like, you know, I think that most everyone would agree, there's a huge amount of prejudice, there's a huge amount of fat phobia, like, that is a way that it's like, seems like the most accepted way to discriminate, because like, oh, so I think it's wonderful to be moving in that direction. And I feel like there are some things happening, right? Like there are more and more voices in this cause. Mm -hmm. but along with that, you know, what you were saying about we, you ask somebody, well, why do you want to be thin? Like, why is that important to you? And there is this, okay, well, how I'm perceived. But I think on the other side of that, it's, it's important, not important, but like somebody might feel like it's important because of the way they're perceived, but also because of, being perceived as thin has a huge amount of privilege associated with it because we have right. a society. It's not just like, I want people to look at me and think I'm thin. It's, I want people to look at me and think I'm thin because there is a huge amount of privilege associated with that. It's a status symbol. Right. Yeah. And this is a status symbol, right? And so we believe the thinner I am, the more power I'm going to have. And to some extent, you're right, right? Like to some extent that is true. The issue is that in order to gain that power, you basically have to give up your whole life. It's like golden handcuffs. <laughs> um, do you know what I'm saying? Like it is, I mean, first of all, the vast majority of people, and I always preface this by saying the vast majority of people, no matter how hard they try, will not achieve long-term thinness. They will, most of them will end up breathing 
rebounding and even potentially predicting weight gain over time. I mean, all of these scientific realities, which I know that you chat about with your clients. You know, I look at clients who are even in the category, you know, I have some clients who are, you know, suffering from restrictive eating disorders and sort of in the category of quote unquote successfully controlling their size through restriction. Um, and they're miserable, right? And it's like, and what's actually really unfortunate and really, really sad is that the entire, they're getting all of that status symbol from the external world. The external world is often praising them, right? For these, for, oh, you're doing such a good job. She's so beautiful. She's so thin, right? Meanwhile, again, total golden handcuffs, right? They have no life, right? It's like, great, I'm getting all this praise, but I can't even go out and have dinner with my husband or, or whatever, you know? And so it's sort of, you know, it starts to sort of beg the question, theoretically, we want status and we want power because we want freedom and because we want to be able to have more love and do more things. Um, but if, the, if by definition, the hell that we have to put ourselves through to create the facade of, you know, this particular form of status symbol is enchaining us really to a very hellish way of operating around food in our bodies, you know, is that really freedom or is that a sort of a, a, a trick, right? Again, golden handcuffs. I think, um, you know, Naomi Wolf often, she's a feminist scholar, and this is where there's a lot of intersection, obviously, between fat phobia and feminism, right? And just sort of saying, you know, like, like giving women privileges and status symbol, you know, and status for being thin is like a really, really great way of tricking them into oppressing themselves. You know, it's like, we don't, it's like, I'm, you know, we're going to let them vote. We're going to like give them all of the, you know, we're going to, you know, to some extent, right. Give them more freedoms. We're going to let them work. We're going to let them, you know, do things that men can do. We're going to let them go to college, but we're going to trick them basically into thinking that their power in many ways comes from, how little they can eat, you know, so that they can effectively be less powerful in the world. I mean, it's like women are running around. I often think to myself, I can't imagine what I would have been able to accomplish as a woman if I wasn't so caught up with dieting and trying to make myself thin. Like it really was a second full-time job. It was a second shift. I can't even imagine what I could have accomplished if I had used the energy, all of that energy that I had used towards dieting and trying to become thin and put it towards literally anything else. It's like, God, how powerful could I have been? You know, like what could I have accomplished if I had garnered, taken that energy and put it, at, put it to anything more productive? Um, and so, yeah, I think that, you know, it, in many ways that this is, um, it's, it's a, it's, it is a social, it is a status symbol, but it's also, um, the idea that I can make myself have that status. I can get myself that status if I do it right is, is very, very tricky, right? Because the, links that one has to go to really make a dent in changing their set point weight, which I know is something that we've, we've talked about before and you've made, I love your video about set point weight, um, is so, it's so challenging to do it, right? That it's almost, it's not, it's, it, I mean, it's just not worth the status. I, I mean, certainly I'll speak for myself. Um, so yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's such a great point. And really, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, with, your thoughts about what you do. I mean, like, but I know that with me, like, I really think of everything that I do around, you know, freeing women from these food issues is like, it, it's a feminist issue, right? It's like, I very much think of it that way because it does, it keeps, it's not only the actual time that it takes, like you said, like another full-time job, but just mentally, the things that mentally happen when we're trying so desperately to be thin, it's like, I have so many women that just say like, I can't focus. I can't do anything. And they work yeah. so hard and they're so accomplished, but it's literally like, I, you only have so much time, money, mental bandwidth. Right. And when 80% of that is taken by food, you know, and like, you know, issues with it and dieting, it's like, right. said, to be how powerful could I be? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So it really is like, it's like a giant trick. It's like, let's give people status on the basis of thinness. Let's give women status on the basis of thinness. It's like a giant trick. It's basically a way to like trick us into our own oppression. It's like, we now have the ability to vote. Yay us. But in order to feel like we're, we can be successful human beings, we have to starve ourselves. Right. It's like, we're tricked into just oppressing ourselves. Um, it's really, 
unfortunate. (laughs) Which is like the ultimate captivity, right? Because it's like, if there's somebody oppressing you, you can fight against that person. But Mm -hmm. being tricked into thinking like, oh, no, I'm just depressing myself because I want to. No, I really do want this. Right. Like, like you can't fight against that, you know? Like It's yeah, It's full-on brainwashing, right? It's full on brainwashing and it's incredibly, yeah, it's very, it's a, it's a much more insidious enemy, right? Yeah. Use your language, right? It's like, it's harder to see. It's harder to understand like in many ways, right? It, it's easier. I think, I mean, I don't know. It, 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 I guess it would be easier to fight an enemy that I can see that I blatantly right there. It's like, Oh, you're trying to nail me to the wall. You know, like you're trying to handcuff me. I see you doing it. Um, it is a totally different thing when this is sort of like a silent, uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it's kind of, it's like happening without my knowledge. And I trick myself into thinking, and I think it's my fault, right? I mean, that's, I think one of the most insidious things about dieting is that like, I, I've been, to- I'm told by everyone, including doctors, including medical professionals, including all of these people who I should be able to trust, right? That it's my fault that I'm not thin. Um, and that's, not accurate. It's yeah. not in alignment with biology or science. Um, yeah. That it's your fault and so much praise for, you know, it's like, and then all of these, you know, positive reinforcements of like, oh, wow, you look so great as in you are thinner than last time I saw you, right? It's like, oh, she's so beautiful. Oh, look how thin she is, right? So, right. and all of these, so it's like from all different angles. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It's really unfortunate. I mean, like I've sort of, I mean, you know, I got into this world because I was, you know, struggling with binge eating and I really identified as an emotional eater. Uh, I know I talked about this a little bit earlier on the call, but I'm sort of, it's like, as I get deeper and deeper and deeper into it, I'm like, oh yeah. I'm like, what actually the real problem was, is that like, I just didn't believe that I was okay the way I was. And if I just accepted myself and my food behaviors for what they were, like I could just go on and move on with my life and literally never have to think about this again. All right. And the big challenge is actually getting women to the place where they can just accept themselves. That's the real challenge, right? The real challenge is not, can I eat when I'm hungry and stop when I'm full? That is like the superficial challenge. That's like the ice, right? It's a superficial challenge on like the final layer of the onion. The real hardcore challenge is like, can I just like be cool with myself and move on with my life and just be like comfortable and fine with me as I am? Yeah. And I just, I want to make sure that this is out there as well, because this comes up so much because if if anyone where you have this going on in your head, you're like, but if I just accepted myself and was fine with what's going on, I would just eat and eat all day, every day. And the only thing that I would have is wine and chocolate and bread. And like my life would be horrible. So I just want to like, I think we were both aligned on this, like look into our eyes and know actually when you come to that place of self-acceptance and you're not villainizing food, watch yourself eat more calmly and better than you like ever have in your life. And it's amazing how it builds that trust with yourself. Well, people don't really, intuitive eating is a natural biological instinct, right? Like you don't actually need to learn how to do it. I mean, we learn after years and years of dieting, it's helpful to have it be explained to you. But the reality of the situation is like, if you just stop dieting and just were like, I'm just going to kind of just like really, truly just like accept myself, just like treat myself like a little child in need of love, just be compassionate to myself, do what feels right probably wouldn't feel right, probably wouldn't feel all that good to drink wine and eat chocolate and eat cheese all day long. That may seem right. If you're dieting or if you're currently restricting, that might seem like the case um, because you've been, you're like, oh my God, I want those things. I'm not allowed to have them. But in reality, right, if you actually allowed yourself to have these things, the, rea- the, the likelihood is that you would not just, you actually do have like biological instincts around food that in the, in the context of just like natural, sane self-acceptance, your, your self-regulation actually works pretty well. Like I often give the example of like, I have a sister who is in recovery from um, an eating disorder from anorexia. I hope she doesn't mind me sharing this. I think she, she speaks about this pretty publicly. So I think I can share this story on her behalf. She basically overcame this by just literally just saying like, you know, screw it. Like, I just can't restrict anymore. I just can't do this anymore. I have to just like eat what I want. She never had any language around intuitive eating. She never did any work around quote unquote hunger and fullness or anything. She literally was just like, screw it. I just can't diet anymore. I'm just going to do what feels good to me and what feels right to me. Right. And it was just, and that was that. 
that. And like over time, sure. In the beginning, like I'm sure, I mean, and I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing for her, right. Based on what I see for other clients. I didn't, I don't even remember really having conversations with her, but I'm sure early on in her recovery, she was eating a lot more foods that were just like, this is the thing I've been wanting for so long that I haven't been letting myself have. But over time, it's like, you know, I look at her now 10 years later, five years later, whatever the case may be. And she just eats like, it's just, it's just, she eats when she's hungry. She stops when she's full. She doesn't even think about it, right? It's not even a thing that we have to think about it. It's just, it's actually naturally biologically ingrained in us. If you didn't give a shit about food, right? Like if you were just like, screw this, I don't care. If I don't give a shit about food, food loses power over us. It stops being the thing that we think about all damn day. Excuse my language, right? I actually have space. I don't need to eat ch cheese and chocolate and drink wine all day long because I'm actually busy doing other stuff. Yeah, right. And I can have it anytime. And this is not my last chance. And you know, it's like all of this, we remove that. I think it's so interesting how the diet industry just, I see all of these ways that they're hijacking totally natural things. Like, oh, do you want to detox? Well, you have to do all this. It's like, actually you have a liver, like you have an internal organ that has been doing this your whole life. It's like, oh, you, you want to know how to eat normally well you have to follow this this diet or intuitive eating it's like actually when you just get all of the craziness out of the way your body just tells you when you're full and when you're hungry and it's like not a big deal so i think it's interesting like just for those listening feel free to raise an eyebrow anytime someone's like oh well you need this certain thing to learn how to do a thing that's like you might want to ask well does my body does my biology naturally do that on its yeah, own. exactly. I think that people forget that eating is a biological instinct. I actually like take the position with like, if you're trying to control your biological instincts in any given way, shape or form, there's a really, really, really good chance you're going to backfire. Like I often give the metaphor of like breathing, right? Like you don't think about breathing. You just breathe. It's just happening. It's an instinct, right? Like you're not worried that you're going to like breathe in too much oxygen or let too much out or anything like that. It's just happening, right? I can temporarily control my breath, right? Like, <laughs> that's basically what doctors are telling us to do with food. They're like, try and control your breath. They're like, breathe in the right amount and breathe out the right amount every single day for the rest of your life, right? It's not going to work. At some point, you're going to like, <laughs> you're just gasping for air. You're going to be like, oh, I can't do this anymore, right? And if you just let your breath just kind of do its thing, right? If you actually just stopped thinking about it, just like fully just let your biological instincts take over. If you've been doing this thing forever, <laughs> yeah, sure, you're going to gasp for air, right? Like you're going to have a <sighs> moment, right? And then at some point, you're just going to start breathing like a regular person again, right? You're just going to be like, huh, okay. If you don't go back to dieting, if you don't go back to... <laughs> you're just eventually just going to start breathing. It's just going to be like natural instinct that you don't even have to think about, right? Eating is the exact same thing. I think that, I feel like one of the fundamental problems with the diet industry is that we forget that eating is a biological instinct, right? It's literally like, it's just, if I just didn't think about food, food would just happen to me, right? I mean, it would just be a thing that happens in my life. After a long period of dieting, am I going to eat more of it? Yeah, which makes sense. Biologically, evolutionarily makes sense. Um, but at some point, right, like I think that that biological instinct is just going to take over when food is no longer like front and center in my brain, like have to have it right now. I'm like now have a life because I don't care about food. I'm not worried about my weight. I can go do other things. I can go, you know, I don't know, watch a movie, like hang out with my friends, like get a hobby, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> do work that I love. You know, it's, I have a life outside of food today. Right. So, yeah. um, yeah, I think that that's people, I think like that's sort of like the biggest issue is like people are so terrified of their own instincts around food. And the reality of the situation is your instincts around food are far more functional than your attempts at controlling it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and you, even the thought of like, oh, well, you know, what about all our foods today? And you know, they're so processed and it's like, yeah, but when you take all the morality out of it and you, you eat like, you know, lower quality processed food, like your body tells you, you're like, oh, I'm tired. I feel not good. And then yeah. it's like, oh, well, there's no morality. There's not like, I can never have bonbons until tomorrow. So it's like, oh, well, maybe I won't eat them right now. Maybe I'll eat like a vegetable because we want to feel good. Like it becomes so much of this like biological, oh, like how do I want to eat depending on how I want to feel and not 
okay, well, what can I get before I have to eat right. food that will make my body do this other thing? This is like a key transition for moving out of diet mentality and diet culture. Like I feel like one of the most important things for actually thinking differently is transitioning out of what can or should I eat to make my body look a certain way? And like, what do I actually legitimately want to eat? Not just in reaction to what I haven't let myself have in the future, but actually what do I want to eat? Because of like, how do I, to use your language, how do I want to feel, right? How do I want to feel? And what would be good and pleasurable and fun for me? And what would be emotionally satisfying for me, right? What do I holistically want? Like, what do I want in the whole picture of what that means to want something, right? Uh, people always say, oh, I feel like shit. I've just been eating whatever I want. And I'm like, well, if you feel like shit, you're probably not eating what you want, right? Because if you don't want to feel like shit, there's like a conflict of wants there, right? There's like something not lining up with the wants, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> like it's a little bit of a misnomer to say I'm eating whatever I want and I just can't stand how much, how shitty I feel, right? If you feel like shit, there's, that's not like a fully holistic want, right? Yeah. Does it make and getting sense? in touch with our desires. Like, I mean, I can speak from my own experience and I hear this all the time from my clients. It's like, oh, as soon as you aren't eating crazy anymore, like you're not eating and like, you know, reacting to, you know, the deprivation. And when you actually start eating in just like a natural, like not a big deal, like you're back to normal eating, right? you figure out your actual desires. I know that for me, like I thought that trail mix was like my crack. Like I thought that it was like an addictive food for me because whenever I would start on it, I would just go insane. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember like, you know, after being a normal eater and being totally over bulimia for a while and just like fine with food, I remember like having some trail mix and being like, this is like not amazing, <laughs> you know? And it's yeah. like, I hear this all the time from, you know, the women in my program is like, oh wait, I'm not actually obsessed with you know, cheese. It was just the thing that I felt like I couldn't have. So all of a sudden it's like, it, you actually get to know what foods you like. What if we like all in our lives before we die, got rid of the deprivation and knew what food we liked? What if that was just like a thing that we all knew what food you really liked? Wouldn't that be cool? Miracle. Miracle. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. Um, yeah, it's just, it is, it is kind of incredible what happens when you take away the deprivation, but yeah, I would make the argument like, right. Like the deprivation, you know, is, it is absolutely a hundred percent connected to body image and absolutely a hundred percent connected to like, basically, am I trying to control my body size in some way, right? Like explicitly or implicitly. Um, and that's really something to look at, right? And like, if we're not doing the body image work, it's very hard to not have judgments of what we're eating and very hard to not sort of have those like implicit, like that emotional deprivation, so to speak. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we talk about, so here's diet culture, diet mentality. We're understanding that a bit more, you know, we're sprinkling in some other things that have just been so fun to like rant with you with, right? Like this is like, this is good stuff. So knowing this, like having this awareness, what would you say, Isabel, to really bring people down to, okay, like you're aware now. So what do we do? What are just like some steps that people can take moving forward to help with this mentality or this realization of how um, diet mentality is impacting their life? So one trick that I often, this is like a cheap trick that I often, often ask people just to think about, just to meditate on. And this is a hard exercise, so don't expect this to be easy, but it's just something that you, just something to think about, just something to like put in your like little mental bank of something to think about. If I waved a magic wand and was like, weight doesn't exist, right? Like your weight is not a thing that can change. Thin and fat just doesn't exist. We're just like taking weight completely off the table of the conversation. Again, challenging thing, but like just imagine a, in a pretend alien world, right? Where weight is not a thing, right? Thin and fatness or food doesn't affect your weight at all. We're just taking weight right off the table. How, what choices would you make around food? Now, again, I think that it's very easy. There are going to be anyone who is currently dieting is going to be like, I would just eat chocolate all day long. And I almost want to say to you, go try that and tell me if that's actually the truth. Because if I'm telling, there's likelihood is that you're going to feel like shit having nothing to do with weight, right? Like nothing, 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 nothing to do with weight, right? So realistically, likelihood is if you took weight off the table of what you, of, of, of how, well, how you're making food decisions, likelihood is that you probably still wouldn't just eat nothing but cheese and drink red wine all day because it would 
feel bad. Like it would actually make you feel bad, right? After all, you are an animal, right? That, think about how animals eat. So one question that I always ask, well, the cheap trick that I always offer is like, if you're taking weight completely off the table, what choices would you make? Not just because you can make them because they don't affect your weight, but what choices would you make because of just the way you want to feel and how you want to live your life, right? Like, you know, health is still something that you might want to consider health in like the broad sense of which means lots of different things to lots of different people. But I think, um, you know, like I'm a person where it's like, I absolutely make decisions around food that have to do with like, do I want to have a blood sugar spike right now? Do I want to have energy to get through my day? I think about food just the way I think about things like caffeine, for instance, like how's this going to affect me? So am I going to have like a spike now, but I'm going to crash later? Do I want to, if I feel really full, how is that going to affect my work day? You know, I think about all of those um, elements when I'm making choices around food and also think about what would just be pleasurable and feel good and make me feel good today and emotionally satisfy me. You know, it's a holistic decision. I think about all of those things. The thing that I don't consider when I'm making choices around food is what's going to, you know, make me thinner or fatter. Because I know that that's a useless conversation for me to have, right? Like I have never successfully gone down that path and not ended up binging my face off or like not ended up completely like in the throes of some, of effectively an addiction to the pursuit of weight loss, right? I think that that's a really good um, definition of a mentor of mine named Deb Burgard. Uh, she once described in a casual conversation, although I know if she said it to other people, she once described eating disorders as addictions to the pursuit of weight loss, right? Whether you're succeeding or not is not the issue. It's the addiction to the pursuit, right? That is problematic. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, if I think about what I want to eat, like I'll consider all sorts of things. I'll consider how it's going to affect me physically. I'll consider how delicious it tastes. I'll consider my social, what's on my social calendar for the day. I'll consider what's available to me, what I have time for, what's convenient. I'll consider all the things that one might consider when making a food decision. The thing that I am practiced at taking off the table is, is this like a food that's going to make me thinner or fatter because that's a conversation that's not worth having. Like that's a conversation, that's a consideration that always takes me down a negative path, whether it be negative because it leads to obsession or binge eating or whatever the case may be. That's sort of the, the consideration that I'm trying to take off the table, but I still have all of these other considerations when I make decisions around food. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's beautiful. And just to you know, even expand that. Like if we take that off the table of like, how does this affect my weight? Mm -hmm. Like, or how does this make me, you know, look or, you know, it's like we eat for so many other reasons. I remember realizing one day, like, oh, the exercise that I do now is because it's what I want to do. And it's nothing about like, how, how is this going to affect my weight? Right. What we wear, what if we weren't dressing to look thinner? Right. It's like you all of a sudden get this huge amount of freedom in your life when you take this variable of how is it impacting my weight? It's like, right. that's really like the world opens up. It's like all of a sudden I can like wear different things. I can like cultivate a sense of personal style. Honestly, the realistic situation is that the health decisions that I make around food are very um, different when I'm taking weight off the table, because the truth is, is that sometimes what is actually healthiest for me is not necessarily what I would have considered the thin choice in the past. You know, it's like everything sort of changes everything. I feel so much more in integrity with my choices and like I actually can make the choices that are best for me when I take this very destructive thing called how's it going to make me look off the table um, and really start to think about the things that are really in alignment with my values systems and what's important to me and like start to really focus on like how do I want to operate around food that has that's uh, like separate from this bullshit you know like yeah yeah amen amen yeah. <laughs> I love it so thank you like that's so wonderful to just have you know some practical things some good mental exercises moving on and Thank you for just giving so much value and being willing to share. Um, and just for our chat today on the, this awesome subject, I'm so glad you've gone to talk about it. Um, anything, anything else you feel we're missing and making like our, our chat for today complete? Yeah, no, I just, I, yeah, I just kind of want to reiterate, you know, like this is about like 
like I think that the the concept of self caring and the concept of self controlling are mutually exclusive, right? Like it's very very hard to self care and integrity when you're constantly trying to control the outcome of what your body looks like, right? The only way to do one people often talk about self care like self care is the way to weight loss, right? But if you're attempting self care as a way to try and control the outcome of the way your body looks, like you're actually you have a conflict, you have a clash, right? The only way to really self care is to actually take what my body's going to look like off the table. You're like, that's not my business. My weight's not my business. Like what I end up looking like is, is actually getting in the way. It's actually clouding my ability to see my authentic desires. And that's just really, I think the takeaway that I want people to talk from take from this end of this conversation is like the more that I can separate my food decisions from my size, the more integrity and more authenticity I'm going to be able to make my food decisions with. Um, so yeah, so I'll just leave. I think that that's a really, really great point to leave on. So I'll just, I'll just wrap up with that. I will say also, um, definitely everyone who, if you ha are listening to this and are kind of interested in more in, um, some of these mindset shifts away from diet mentality, diet culture, uh, check out my video training series if you haven't already. Yeah. So I was yeah. just going to say that. So, I mean, for people to get more of you, like, yes, we have the link in the show notes below. Um, you guys, uh, Isabel, she has a great um, video training series um, that is free. So yeah. go there and check it out. Anything else where you would direct people to just get more of this goodness and like being able to, to learn more? That's the place to start. I'm an email person. You probably know this about me, Lydia. I don't do a ton of social media. I'm like the only person who doesn't do a ton of social media. I communicate via email. So if you want my blogs, right, or if you're interested in my content, um, I send like emails on a weekly-ish basis to people just with like literally just an e one email a week or so, which is a... Um, like a practical mindset shift, right? That you can sort of implement to change your relationship with food. Um, sign up for my video training series, Stop Fighting Food, link below. Um, you'll get those automatically, but if not, you can also sign up for them on my website, isabelfoxandjuke.com. Perfect, yes. So click the link below and you can get all that information. And thank you so much for being on. And just like, you know, visualizing, <laughs> you know, just this is a thought experiment of like, imagine a world full of women, you know, for bringing this back to like this feminist issue mm -hmm. is like, imagine a world full of women who are in touch with their authentic desires, mm -hmm. who aren't enslaved by, you know, their mental energy and their physical well-being, who are like taking care of themselves with self-care, like in touch with what they want to do, have the power to do so. Like it's, what, why does that change the world? You know, like it's a big oh, yeah. deal. It's no, a it's really big deal and it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is like such a critical feminist issue. Like this is like, this is like, I mean, I don't want to say it's the women's issue of our time. <laughs> I feel like there are a lot of women, again, there are lots of women's issues left, but this is a really, 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 really serious way that women are just being completely again, handcuffed, right? It's like handcuffed to, I need to be thin, I need to be thin in order to gain, garner value in this world, right? And it is horribly destructive. I mean, it is causing so much pain and suffering, right? And if we could sort of collectively decide, screw that, right? Like I actually am gonna take care of myself and pursue my own life. I am not going to ascribe myself to these ideas of I must be thin in order to live my best life. I'm just going to go and actually live my best life right now because guess what? This is a trick. It's a trap. It's a trap. Trying to pursue this is actually handcuffs. It's actually handcuffs. It is not freedom. It is a total trick. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, and the real situation is like, you know, Letting go, dieting is just like you're just gonna end up whatever your natural weight is that you probably avoid anyway. Trying to get yourself out of your natural weight doesn't usually work for most people. It's incredibly painful. You are able to do it for the very small portion who are, and most people won't be able to. And it's like hating yourself for it. It's just, it's just a nightmare. You're literally better off just embracing your natural size, right? Just like letting your biological instincts operate the way they're designed to and meant to, and saying screw you to culture, diet culture, and go like living the life that you want to lead. Yeah, beautiful. There I you go. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for being on and for sharing. I love the work that you do. Again, you can look at, uh, click the link below in the show notes for more information and the free video training series. And thank you so much, Isabel, for being back on the show.
Thank you so much, Lydia. Talk to you soon. All right. Perfect. So you guys um, feel free, you know, check that out. There's so much great things, you know, uh, available and more and more, right? It's like, I feel like this is a good movement that's happening. Um, and, you know, for uh, more information just about these sorts of topics and, you know, getting free of food crazies, there's a new video here every Monday. You can also go to uh, Lydia lifestyle.com for your free ebook um, and possibly if there are availabilities um, a free session and um, a newsletter as well so there's some great things there um, to check out some more resources and this is Lydia the lifestyle coach and Isabel Fox and Duke signing off and mwah. bye guys you have so many options you can watch more videos you can subscribe for new videos every Monday. You can even join our Facebook group with an amazing support community.